Finding a place to put the amplifier is very important and is the next thing on our list of things to do. It's an F-150. We know where we're gonna put the amplifier. It's here behind this seat. These seats do come out, although it's not made to. Like, there's no cool button you pull or anything like that that's easily accessible. You have to hunt for it. In your installation, there's a couple other places. Underneath the seat, a side panel in the trunk. The only place I don't recommend putting the amplifier is mounted to the subwoofer enclosure. Just don't put it there. I don't want to have that debate. Depending on what make of Ford you have, there is a lever that needs to be pulled right here to unlatch this. This particular Ford doesn't have the seat that moves with the back meaning it's affixed to this wall. It's the shorter cab that has the suicide doors on it. For those vehicles, Ford is nice enough to put this on there. However, you have to have really skinny hands to get in there and you can just get a finger on it and, and uh, pull it and then the seat will fold down. And it reveals this area right here. This is what we're looking for. The only part that you have to remove is this little area right here. You wanna remove this because that's where you're gonna screw your bracket into. Otherwise, the bracket will sit on top of all this and keep your road noise to a minimum. When building your bracket, don't cover this vent up entirely. Behind here, there is a vent. That's for the air exchange in the car, you know, when you shut your doors so you don't blow out your window on a hot day. Now, what we're going to go for with this amplifier is mounting it something like this because there's controls on this end that we're going to need to get to. And it just makes it easier to access the wiring on this side if we ever need to. You could put it like this if you want, but then the kicker logo is going to be upside down and that would drive me crazy and if we put it like this well we can't get to those controls on the bottom side of the amplifier this off the ground lined up to the top of this area here will be perfect and we'll just bring it up like this and over and down so that we can put some screw rivets here and put it in place we'll bring our piece of plastic over to about here so we have plenty of room to zip tie all our wiring into place down here on the bottom is a place for your power wire to go through and then we're going to run all our signal wire behind this mat up around and down that side of the car that's going to be two pieces of speed wire because this is an aluminum vehicle and a lot of cars are starting to become aluminum you're going to want to run a power and a ground to the battery whether aluminum is conductive or not that's not the debate. The debate is how they're welding the cars together. There's a lot of glue that holds those two aluminum panels together. That glue adds a lot of resistance, which means you don't get as good of a ground between the front and the back. Ford knows this. There's ground strips all throughout the vehicle to bring the car together. We're going to do the same thing. In the past, we've tried various combinations. The easiest thing to do is to just go to the battery. To achieve that, we're going to be using this stuff here. The reason why it is red and yellow is because it is for marine but it is a stinger dual four gauge power wire yellow is ground red is power for us and we'll put that all throughout the car now another thing too with that particular amplifier it doesn't have any fusing on the side of the amplifier for size constraints kicker sends the external fuse with it as well as we're going to be putting a second fuse underneath the hood in the box it comes with instructions here as well here explaining why it comes with this fuse. We'll make sure we have room to mount that on our panel. For this, we'll be using some quarter inch ABS. So we'll go 17 inches tall. What I like to do is I like to draw out a basic sketch of what I'm going to be making. It isn't always perfect, but you know, gets the job done. So really we have just a basic shape here that has this part right here that's gonna stick up. So it's gonna be a 17 inch piece of plastic that's gonna be 13 inches across. And we'll make a notch here to remove these two portions so that it will screw into this area right here. And there we go. So we just need to cut this little piece out right here and then we can rivet that in place. Let's get it wired up. That's my favorite part. Now this amplifier was designed perfectly for this style application. When mounting it to our panel, we wanna make sure we put it all the way to this far corner here so that we maximize our real estate for our wiring. Power wire is located on the top, which is perfect because we can run that along the outside here. So we'll mount our fuse holder in this area like this and then our grounds and whatnot and then they'll come 
come out and go this way. This whole end of the amplifier on the bottom is where all the signal inputs and outputs are. So those can come in this area and then move across here. We won't have any of them overlapping each other other than the subwire, which is up here at the top. But we can bring that in real tight and have it pass underneath the power wires coming out of the amplifier. On this side of the amplifier is where all our controls are. The first thing we want to grab right here is how we're going to input into this. For this, we are going to be using high level, so we'll select that. And we want to use the DC offset. Next up is sub input. This is tricky. What it's telling us here is that we have a choice between feeding it the signal from amp two, which would be the rear, or sub input. And the reason why this is tricky on this install is that the lower end frequencies come out of the fronts, not the rears. The rears are crossed over from the factory and limit the amount of bass that they get. If we connect this blindly, meaning we just autopilot, connect the rears in, connect the fronts in, flick that switch, we leave this at amp two, well, we're not going to get the sub response we had hoped for. So the nice thing about the software is that we can go ahead and do an emulation run and figure out what we want it to be. Select break channels, there's gonna be no fader on, sub source. And boom, right there is what we're looking for. So in the software, it gives us the option to select subsource, amp one or amp two. And that's what we were wanting to check. We wanna make sure that we can use amp one and we don't have to do any funny wiring. So that answers that question. There are several things about this amplifier that are extremely unique. You don't have to use the DSP that's in the amplifier, although I don't know why you wouldn't, but you don't have to. If you wanna just hook this up as a conventional amplifier with believing that it has no DSP, that's why a lot of these controls are on here. You can set your crossover, your gains, you can flick all the switches, but the reality of it is, is you only have to flick a couple of them over here on the turn on, the input level, and then the rest is gonna just be controlled through the software. So now that we know that, we can move forward with our mount. Because we used ABS, we wanna pre-drill our holes for our amplifier. You don't just wanna screw into ABS, it does funny things and, and doesn't always work out that well. The other thing too is that this amp does have a bass knob, and I have terrible memory for bass knobs, so I like to just go ahead and plug that in as soon as possible so I don't forget to do it. Now let's just go ahead, start wiring up the amp.
hands. And just like that, we are done with the install. Now, for those of you wondering why the tape is on here, some of these holes are close to the heat sink of the amplifier. We don't want to scratch it. So two layers of blue tape will keep that from happening. Looking at the install, what did we do that's a little bit different? RCAs and the speaker wires, we went ahead and put those on half inch risers. So they're sticking up above everything else. The reason why we did that is the subwire and the base knob needed to come over here. This is gonna go like this up into the car and this needed to make a turn to follow the power wire because the base knob is gonna go on the driver's side. There's not enough to loop it all the way around and back to here. In order to perform that turn, adding risers to these allowed us to do that. Power and ground run next to one another. Went ahead and matched up the kicker logo so they're both going the same direction. On the ends of the RCAs, the RCAs have a white this is a gray. If we follow that all the way down to the ends of our speed wire, we have a white and we have a gray, so we know which goes to which in the dash. At this point, we're pretty much ready to go ahead and get this into the car. Once we get it in there, we'll go ahead and we'll drill the holes for where these need to go. So the nice thing about wiring everything up on the bench is that essentially all we have to do is get into the car now, run the power wire down one side, which is two wires and the base knob, and then run the two other wires that way. That's it. We don't have to hang out in here and do all this wiring and all that. We gotta drill two holes. So for this, we're gonna use these. These are threaded nut certs. They go in like a rivet and they crush. That allows us to put a screw inside of it. So this is all set and ready to go. We just need to hop over to that side, run the speaker wire up. I'll meet you guys in the dash. So what we've gone ahead and done is soldered up the connections for our feed. What we have left to do is this here needs to be attached to our plug in order to feed the amplifier. To strip this wire, what you wanna do is put your razor knife at the smallest setting that it can and just go into it and pull it back. Then get all the paper off, of course. I'm gonna go ahead and twist these together. We just need to make sure that when we're putting these in, we get the polarity in the right direction. On this one, it starts with white on the top, and it goes to white black. Polarity is extremely important. As you're doing these systems, where you have multiple connections all throughout the car, keeping track of that is becoming more and more difficult. We always do a polarity check when we're done wiring up a car because of that. The problem sometimes is finding out if you do have something out of polarity is where it's out of polarity, especially when you're doing a high level system. Screwing up the input is way worse than screwing up the output. There's fewer connections here on the input side going into the amplifier than on the output side. So you just have to be diligent when you're connecting these things. But accidents do happen and polarity is one of the things that is easy to screw up. Now make sure all your wires are nice and tight. You can give them a little bit of a yanking just to make sure. We'll go ahead and plug those in. And by plugging these in, that finishes up the signal side of the install. The only thing we have left to do to hear this and start doing all our testing and making sure everything is the way it's supposed to be is connect the power wire. So why don't we go out underneath the hood and take a look at that with Fernando while I finish putting this radio back together so that when he's done, we can actually listen to it. We make a ABS quarter inch mount for the fuse. We have two, two bolts that's holding the mount right here, so it's not gonna move. And of course we have our ground from here to here. Now that the power is connected, we can move right on to the polarity test before we do anything else. We wanna make sure all the speakers are moving in the direction we want. And we immediately found a problem with the passenger tweeter. It's popping red. Now we have to figure out why it's popping red because there's a couple different places it could be bad. When I say popping red, what I mean is that every speaker in here is popping green and that one is popping red. We don't want it to pop red, we want them all to pop green or we want them all to pop red, we don't want one 
that's different unless we designed it that way. Meaning if we wanted both the tweeters to be out of polarity with the mid-range, that's cool. They would both have to be that way. We didn't want that. We wanted them all in the same direction. The speaker in the door is moving in the right direction. That means that the signal coming into the crossover is correct. It's not backward. If that was the problem, it could be the wire coming into the crossover, the connection coming out of the radio. So there's a lot of places that could go wrong. Luckily, it's not. We can see the crossovers because they're right here behind the dash. So we can see it go red, black, red, black, red, black, red, black. And we can see the corresponding colors. We know that coming out of the crossover is correct. The mid-range is correct. It's just simply at that tweeter is backward. Now, how could the tweeter be backwards if the tweeter is clearly marked? It's a tweeter. I'm going to tell you right now, if there's going to be a speaker that a manufacturing facility is going to get wrong, it's going to be the tweeter. Tweeters, I don't know what it is, man. They just can never get those wires right. Now you flip it. He's getting green. More than likely what happened is somewhere in the manufacturing chain, they flipped it. We're because humans. We're humans, they make mistakes, it's okay. Well, he's human, I don't know about me. <laughs> I've been called worse, so. I'll be back. Okay, I'll be back. All the speakers are going the right directions now. That's good, we can move on to the next thing. I promised you I'd show you what the output of the amplifier looks like, so we decided to go with the DSP with the EQ. I have dual RTAs hooked up. We can look at the front, we can look at the back. We're playing pink noise. This is the front, this is the rear. This is what we were talking about when we said the front has the subwoofer output, the rear does not. It's got some, so you could definitely EQ it up if you need it, but it's not there as prevalent as it is on the front. The rear has this strange peak here too. This has this little bump right here and then it's adding a little high frequency there for the tweeter. This area here and this area here look very similar, which is the mid range. And that's why we said, if you like the way it sounds and you just want it louder, you don't necessarily need to go EQ DSP, go the whole nine yards. If you are changing speakers and you find that the bass mid and treble adjustment on the radio isn't enough to get you where you want, then you definitely need a some form of an EQ DSP. Now all we have to do is plug everything back into the amplifier, come over here, open the software up for the amplifier, and put in our parameters. So when using any type of tuning software, often they ask you to label what it is you're doing. In this case, we always pick the model of the car, year of the car, and the color of the car. Next. In this case, we're not bridging any channels. We're gonna be using the fader. We want our subsource to come from amplifier one input. All the channels are going to be full range and the subwoofer will be subwoofer. We have to pick what size subwoofer we're using. In this case, we're using two Compart T10s. The next thing is distance from listening position. We're gonna go ahead and enter that here in this particular software startup page. We're going ahead and take it some measurements from the driver's seat ear to each one of the speakers. And once we have all that information, we'll select finish. Now on this particular software, it's going to give you diagrams here of what you have connected in the car. So we have our front speakers, we have our two rear speakers, and we have our subwoofer. We can select any individual speaker we want. The first thing we want to do is adjust the crossover. We want to pair these two together because we're going to cross them over at the same frequency. So we're going to come up here to settings and we'll check link crossover and we'll select OK. On this, you can link the EQ, which on the rear channels, we're going to link the EQ. We're not going to do right and left EQ on those because it's just an effect channel and you can link levels and we'll select okay crossover panels over here we'll go ahead and select i like link wix riley 24 db and then we'll select our high pass filter and we'll just check the other speaker to make sure that they're both actively crossed over at the same we'll grab one of the rears we'll do the same and then we'll check it just to make sure it's showing us over here what our crossover slope is on the eq so that we know when we're adjusting the eq we really don't have to worry about anything on this side of it here the sub Subwoofer has already auto set itself. If we want to change that crossover point, we can come in and do that. It also activates the high pass, which is going to give us a band pass here or a subsonic filter. They pick 25 hertz at a 24 dB slope. Those are the basic settings that you need to do on any amplifier. If you're doing time correction, if you're not doing time correction, you can skip over that and go right to the crossover. Once you get the crossover set up, you can actually start listening to the system and see what's going on and start working on the EQ. This has 31 bands of equalization for each channel. A lot of DSPs do. We're not going to get into that because this video is strictly just showing you how to get this five channel amplifier into the car and wired up, which I think we did. Yeah, it's wired up and ready to go. Naturally, we're not going to leave without letting you hear it. Let's turn it on and see what it sounds like. 
kidding. And the bass knob works. Awesome. <laughs> Fernando? On to the next one, guys. Thank you so much for watching. As always, you guys have a great night. Bye. Bye.